Welcome to China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. In this next part of our exclusive special series with Michael Sikora, founder and director of the Socrates Project within the Reagan White House, we revisit myth number two, how manufacturing is the key when it comes to countering the China threat. Previously, we covered the topic as a slight overview, but this time we're digging in. Mike, thank you so much for joining us again. Great to have you back on the show. Oh, it's my pleasure. Co covered a lot of good material last time. I th think we had a lot more good to cover. I think we were touching on manufacturing a bit. So when it comes to countries like China, there's the cheap labor aspect. But how does that tie into the manufacturing issue? Because we hear all these different terms bobbing about. It's that immersion in finance-based planning that literally caused the problem with manufacturing. And because we're still immersed in finance-based planning, us being the United States and the Western world in general, that means we're just going to make a mistake in the other direction. Let me explain what I mean. Back what, in the 70s, starting in the 70s, 80s, there was this move in the business schools, was pushed by people like Harvard Business, about, you know what? If you download your manufacturing, it's going to make you tremendously more competitive. Now, from a finance-based planning perspective, it makes tremendous sense. Because finance, finance, or manufacturing is very uh, intensive in terms of money. Uh, capital, all these things to put a production plan in, in place. And then you've got the cost of labor. And it's just massive financially. Okay. And all that has to happen is a little bit of a tweak in the market, and you're carrying all this manufacturing at a loss. And you don't want to get rid of it, but maybe you end up selling it, and then it turns around and you need it back again. So it's, it's horrible. So the professors at places like Harvard Business Review said, you know what? To be competitive, get rid of manufacturing. So starting in the 70s, the common wisdom was decouple from manufacturing, put it off to wherever there's cheap labor, whoever, and in many cases, the government would subsidize the building of manufacturing facilities, let the government, because you know, the Chinese government, the, the uh, Korean government can absorb all this impact of up and down and things like that, so let them have the manufacturing. But then also something else happened along the same lines, but manufacturing has always been the focus, is a lot of companies also said, look, well, you know, if it worked for manufacturing, I bet you it would work for marketing. Let's unload our marketing. Profits went up again. And actually, it got so bad that they were unloading all these functions, R&D, manufacturing, sales, call centers, everything else, to a lot to China and other little countries. All of a sudden, there was a push that said, you know what? Your real value is your name. So let them do everything. You don't even have to have much of a staff, because all you need to do is put your name on it. So you have them build it, them design it, them do the R&D, and then all of a sudden, let them ship it in on their shipping containers. Your name is on it, and guess what? You almost have pure profit, because the cost is nil. Almost all the cash that comes in is profit. Well, do you know what the next step is by China? It's like. We don't need your name. So now we can basically, we got 99% of the technology. Now all we've got to do is just peel off the made in GP, GT, GE, and then put on another label. Now we got it all. The company's out of business. Okay, not particularly talking about GE. But the point is, it got to that point. Okay. And from a finance, because again, the Americans are so immersed in finance-based planning that they could take this initially downloading, offloading the manufacturing, and then go to the stockholders, go to the board. And because remember, all these people look, the only way they look at results is the finance. And if all these things, if they can go in there and say, look, if we get rid of manufacturing, look at the, how our costs are going to drop, and look how much our increase our profit, and it stays a more stable profit. So the board says tremendously, yes. Stockholders say yes. Poof, no problem. One of the things that's really, really nice about finance-based planning is its numbers. So if somebody can say, if we download this, our profits will increase by 
And the other guy says, well, if we keep it, you know, we can do these things, but our profits will be where they are. Well, 20 is bigger than 20, zero, so therefore we go with 20. Okay, easy decision. And that's one of the reasons finance-based planning is so, so attractive, is because numbers are easy to look at. Five is smaller than 10. 20 is smaller than 10. 20 is smaller than 10, 10 is bigger than 5. So you can look at them and very easily make decisions. So it was all downloaded. But now some people have said, you know what, That's some value actually comes out of manufacturing. So what we need to do is bring manufacturing back. But it also comes back to this silver bullet approach, which is this one magical technology is going to save the day. So now there's this push on bringing manufacturing back. But what the Americans don't realize, and it's not apparent really from finance-based planning, is that the real battle never took place in manufacturing. Because downloading manufacturing, places like China, created a weakness that China and others fully exploited to their advantage. Build all these industries out of it, which then generate all these funds and everything else all technology strategy based. But bringing manufacturing back will not necessarily be a US strength. And that's what they want to say. The, the, the difference between a weakness and a strength is not apparent. Just because you had a weakness and removed it doesn't mean all of a sudden you have a strength. It just means you no longer have a weakness to exploit. But what they don't realize is that the competitive advantage that China achieved was not by acquiring the manufacturing. The competitive advantage that China achieved was through their technology strategy. Because remember, it's, it's a chess game of offensive-defensive. So if they allow us to have this particular manufacturing, and they know that we need this technology to bring it to the next level, which would allow it to be competitive with something they're doing, which they need for moving forward, they'll block us from accessing it. Let me digress for a second. Silk, the new Silk Road. Let's talk about that for a second. Everybody's familiar with that. And all the studies that were done that I have seen address it from a financial point of view and political point of view. Okay. Where it says, hmm, and there was, a, I forgot which think tank came up, the list of 10 things to check when the, uh, somebody offers you new Silk Road, you know, to build something, a road or whatever. They said, number one, Make sure that uh, you don't get financially in debt that you can't pay back because then they'll just grab whatever they want. Number two, look at the political ramifications of letting them have a part. There's all these things, but they're all basically financial and political. But that was not the real objective of the New Silk Road. Okay, and it's very, very interesting. So let's go back to what we talked about in our previous conversation, which is that China's objective their national objectives reclaim their position as the world's super dominant power of four generations. And they know to achieve that because, as they say, technology is the foundation of all competitive advantage of the, for a country. They know that they have to become the center of the world for all technology exploitation. Okay, Interesting. Which, as we talked about before, that doesn't mean they're doing all the R&D. That means they're just controlling all the development exploitation and utilization of technology, which means all these paths they've established throughout the world are now going to be utilized to control where, what level we are, how we're utilized, because if you control, let me say, because we know how you exploit the technology dictates the other resources, manpower, natural resources, and everything else, if they control how we exploit technology and they utilize that, that also gives them the leverage to exploit our other resources. So, let's look at the new Silk Road. As we know, technology advancement is nothing more than technology A bumping into technology B to produce technology C. Literally, there's no magic there. Contrary to what the physicists will sometimes say and the researchers about, oh, it's magic, I'll leave me in a room and you know, I'll throw my temples and magic's going to happen. No. Technology A bumping into technology C. B produces technology C. Okay. Point number one. Point number two, technology is nothing more than equipment, material, and know-how. That's what it's comprised of. So if you can control what of those three things you get, the B, 
you can control when a country comes up with C. Equipment material. The New Silk Road's objective, if you really look at how it was being designed, was to control the shipment of all equipment and material. Now let's add in know-how, information. Let's look at 5G. Their objective was to be able to control the distribution of information. Okay. So with the new Silk Road combined with the 5G initiative, they would have the ability to basically control what, what came into a country, which would dictate how their technology evolved. So now all of a sudden we can a company or a country rather like France doesn't want to politically line up and do what China wants. All of a sudden they can rattle, throttle back on equipment, material, and know-how such that all of a sudden their technological level stalemates. The rest of the world moves forward. They're less competitive economically and militarily. So that would give them the ability, not 100%, nothing's ever 100%, but a tremendous lever in actually controlling how technology evolves worldwide. Now, there's another way to play the game, and we actually played this, I'm not going to give you the details, but where we shipped certain things over to the Soviet Union. Okay. So the Soviets are expecting they've got some research, and for this research they need a piece of measuring equipment. Okay. Well, we managed to make sure they got it, but it didn't work the way they expected, and they didn't know it. So all of a sudden, this piece of equipment quite wouldn't give them the research they needed. They would expect it to give this reading, and it would give it a different reading. They could never calibrate it, whatever. So the point is, it's not just a matter of blocking. What you can also do is provide other things, such that bugs in software, equipment that works, that won't calibrate, all these various things. Because remember, it's not, as Americans tend to look at it, as here's the magical technology, we get the breakthrough, and that's it. No. It's all fluid. The Asian mind is very fluid. Okay? And all the time that we spent in Taiwan, we saw how fluid their thinking was in terms of strategy. So when it comes to the national technology strategy, manufacturing is this little piece. But the real game is played down here, where that real game is covering the waterfront of all technology. So from a strategy point of view, they, may, they will allow us to have certain manufacturing things. They can block us from moving forward. And at the same time, they will outmaneuver us in other areas like computing, like the quantum, the AI, the food, the agriculture, the, the full range of other functions required for a society. As a result, yeah, we'll get manufacturing back. We'll employ more people. But they will not allow that via their technology strategy to get in their way of them being, of us being a competitor to their and limiting their ability to achieve their national strategy. That was Michael Sikora, founder and director of the Socrates Project within the Reagan White House. And for those watching our full episode, after the break, we continue our exclusive special coverage with Michael Sikora. We move into what the U.S. can do to counter the China threat and what steps need to be implemented. Our full episode is available on Epoch TV. To sign up, click the link down below. Thanks for watching China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. See you soon.